Testing one, two, testing. Okay, we're going to get started here um, now so we can keep things going on time. We have these shortened sessions. You're in the lecture of being in a session that actually crosses over two, so they're going to talk a lot more than wherever you were in your last session. That's good. My name is Kyle Kostelecki. I'm with eExtension, and I uh, run the Military Families Program uh, for eExtension. Um, but that has nothing to do with what you're talking about today. Well, very little to do, probably, directly. Um, but it is my pleasure to uh, host this room for you all today. And a, a couple of uh, housekeeping really, really quick notes. Um, this session is being streamed, um, live streamed, so you just need to know that. Um, if you ask questions, everybody in the stratosphere will get them. Um, um, for those of you that are fielding those questions, please step up to the mic and repeat them so that our streamed audience can hear them. Um, and then if you're answering a question, come on up here too. We do the ambient noise in the room is difficult to pick up. So if you're one of the speakers and you're going to answer them, please come on up here. Try not to roam. Do the best you can to stay close to the microphone. Um, but I, I'll begin and turn it over to Steve. Steve Judd from the University of New Hampshire is, is one of the speakers today. And so you know you're in the right room if you recognize this and this is where you wanted to be. So Steve, go ahead. Thanks, Kyle. Um, who, what band had that song, Rome? Is that like, you know, Rome if you want to. Rome. Yeah, B-52s. OK. So I'll try not to roam, Kyle, but it's, it can be tough to do sometimes. So first of all, thanks for coming today. Um, what we'd like to do is talk with you today about a planning and reporting system that we've been using for a while. And I'll ask that you contain your excitement because I know that planning and reporting systems are the kinds of things that really get people you know, right on the edge of their seat. But we're not going to talk about the system per se that much, enough to give you some familiarity with it. But what we really want to talk to you about is how the sort of information that we can gather from our organizations um, through a system, through a comprehensive system, can be used to really increase the level of engagement that we have with our stakeholders um, and with other folks. So there are a number of people that will be sort of joining in the discussion today. Um, I'm Steve Judd. I'm a IT guy at the University of New Hampshire, uh, Cooperative Extension. And so I've done a lot of work on the sort of programming side of this exercise. Uh, Doug Lontine, uh, Doug, just wave your hand, um, is the <laughs> is the Dean and Director of University of Vermont Extension uh, and has been closely involved. Lisa Townsend is my boss, so you know afterwards, if you see her in the hallway, please go up and say nice things about me. Um, she's the Assistant Director for Program Support at the University of New Hampshire Cooperative Extension. And Robin Lockerbie, who will be uh, joining me shortly to, to keep talking about what we've done, uh, is does planning and reporting support at the University of Vermont Extension. And a person that I don't have on the slide, because I wasn't really sure whether he was going to be here because he didn't tell me, is uh, Dennis Harrington from the University of Maine Extension. Um, and as we get into the discussion, there are some other people here who might want to join in. Uh, Bruce Haas from Michigan State University has uh, been using this system as well and may have some insights to share because I'm really hoping that we have a chance to discuss some things. That's why we asked for sort of two slots. It's pretty boring if we just get up here and blow through a whole bunch of slides and then tell you go on your way to your next session. So we'd really like to get some feedback from you as, as we talk. To give you a little background about this project, um, how many people in here have to plan or report? OK, everybody's with the extension, right? We all have to. Um, yeah, how many love to? Um, but somewhere around 2005, the, there was sort of this change in how we were going to have to report. And, and New Hampshire, in particular, was thinking, all right, we're, the way we're collecting stuff now is not going to work long term. Um, we need to do something. But we're a small state. I mean, some of you come from larger states. We're, we're pretty small. Um, when I tell people that we have 10 counties, they're like, no, 10? 
really, um, and that we can drive from one to the other. You know, it's it's different. Um, and we were like, I don't know if we can do this all ourselves. We probably could have, but we got together with Massachusetts, Maine, and Vermont, and said, why don't we do this together? We all have very similar requirements. Um, we have some differences, but but there are a lot of similarities, and we can probably do a better job if we all work together. Um, in that process, what we found was that we did it. It was the strength of sort of pooling our knowledge and collaborating that I think helped make a system that works effectively not only for ourselves, but, but for some other states that have adopted it. So I'm going to ask Robin to uh, come up and give you just, just a little bit of background about the system, why we made some of the choices that we made, and then we'll go from there. So why do we plan? Um, you know, Extension is a dispersed organization. We're spread all over the place. We have very diverse backgrounds, expertise, passions. And we have a variety of stakeholders who want or need something from us. So the other reality is we have limited resources. So how is it that we harness all of that fo and focus our intentions around what results we hope to see? So we have to plan to protect those resources. For reporting, we need to know, we need to be able to not only be accountable to our stakeholders, but we also need to be able to know how have we done on that path that we laid out? How did we do with making those changes? Do we need to adjust our course? Do we need to invest our resources differently? Those are the discussions that we, that we should be making using the information that we collect from reporting. So I had the good fortune this morning of uh, sitting next to Dave Gray when I was eating breakfast. I think Bruce was at the table as well. Um, and one of the topics that came up was planning. You know, it's like there's some for some people, planning is a bad word uh, because it it implies that you know everything, how everything is going to turn out based on what you do. Um, and I don't think planning is a bad word. I think that it can be implemented poorly. If you do think that you can set out you know, from the get-go and say, if we do this over the next five years, this is what's going to happen, that's a bad thing. But where what we see is what I phrase the virtuous circle. Um, the idea is that we can use a comprehensive system to plan, to report, and really make some adjustments to our plan as we go. Because, again, we don't see these as separate processes. We don't say, OK, plan now. You're done planning. Don't think about this ever again. Uh, what we say is, here's what you've planned. How's it going? Right? How's this working out for you? Are you actually making a change? Have you actually done this? Is it effective? No? Well, maybe it's time we're coming around again. Maybe it's time to revisit our plan and refine it um, so that we're not talking about a monolithic plan that we then is locked in stone. We're talking about how do we adjust that. These slides, I'm not going to read through the slides. If you go to the lanyard uh, site for this session, I actually put the slides at the bottom of that so you have access to those. They're in SlideShare. They'll be there. Um, we'll also end up with the recording from this posted on that same site eventually, so I don't need to really read through these slides. But I think the key thing to know 
is that we see in the center of our system this web-based planning and reporting system. It allows us to collaborate together, work together to formulate a plan for our organization. But that plan for the organization is based on what individuals have in mind, what they're planning to do. So it gives them some of that independence. It's not a necessarily a top-down where, oh, here's the state plan. Everyone has to do exactly this. It says, what are you as an individual going to do? OK, if we take all of that across our organization, what all our individuals said they were going to do, what does that mean we as an organization are intending? And we can take that information and report out to our stakeholders. Again, it's that communication and engagement with the stakeholders that's important. And based on that, we can, again, back into that circle, adjust our planning and our reporting process. So I'm, Robin's going to talk a little bit about sort of what does the stuff that comes out of the system look like. And as Steve said, you hopefully will be able to look at these um, on your own computers uh, when you have time, because some of these are small and you're not going to be able to read them, but hopefully give you an idea enough about some of the things that we think are valuable tools. One of the, um, as Steve had started out, you know, um, so eloquently stating, planning and reporting is not the favorite thing um, for any of us, really, to do, but it's something that we have to do. So there's a couple of... Um, I guess, takeaways that, that we think are valuable to organizations when you think about doing this. And one of those is, is that we have to make sure that our users understand the value of the information that they're giving us because we rely on them to give us good information. If we don't do a good job with getting them to understand that this is valuable and who it's valuable to, why, and how we're using it, then they're not going to have the investment and um, be good users and, and help us uh, achieve our goals. Another way to achieve this is to have what we're using as a tool, and for, in our case, the logic model planning and reporting system, we um, try to make it useful to the individuals. So besides the organizational needs that we fill, we wanted to fulfill some of the individual needs to help um, them in their work. And, and that only makes sense. That's just a, a good partnership. So here, what we do in Vermont specifically, our faculty are unionized, and we ask every individual to input an individual plan. And that includes the different deliverables that they will have. And so one of the things that we do is we produce a report for the individuals that allows them to complete their, their uh, faculty contract. Another item that we produce for the individuals, and they can access this at any time, but it gives them a yearly summary of their uh, work. Uh, during a year, they can go in at any time and get a summary. But at any time, especially around annual review time, reappointment for faculty, they will go back through the years and be able to pull their data. And any of the, any of the information that they've included in the system is there for their access. So we want to make it transparent and easily accessible to the individuals. Organizationally, what we can do with the data that's put into the system is we can understand how our effort is being distributed across the organization, what effort is being supported by grant monies. We can look at the number of volunteers it takes to do specific programs. So there's a variety of information that we can aggregate from the individual reporting, planning and reporting that we use. And this is one of the tools here. We can also aggregate the information because individual plans are put into, and reporting is put into a logic model format. What we can do is then take an organizational view of that logic model, see where people are reporting the results, where, where are the results happening, and what is it, uh, what inputs in terms of programs are contributing to those. And it's all in the logic model format, so it gives you that nice quick synopsis of what's happening. We can look at a county level breakdown of the information because that's one of the elements that we included. So we ask for location. And for counties, that's important to a lot of us. We can understand what deliverables happened in a county, the people that attended from that particular location. We can get the results as they're reported for that location, as well as narratives. We can get those impact stories, and um, they can be specific to that particular location. 
We can also look at participant types. And for us, that could be in Vermont, we have a lot of participant types. Some states choose not to do it that way. So uh, each state can uh, define who those partners are and who those important groups are. But at the time that we developed the system, what was important to us is that the commodity groups like the beef industry, the dairy industry, the um, apple growers, the maple industry, they wanted to know what we were doing for them. This allows us to pull out that information. Another useful uh, feature now is that we find that our stakeholders want more. They don't want to see tables so much anymore. They really want to be able to interact with the information. They want a visual representation. They want something quick. So one of the important elements in our communication efforts is being able to take the information that's put into the system and then exporting it. And in this case, um, I've used a Tableau Public to, to work with some of our data. And we use this for internal communication as well as those external communications. So we can talk about, you know, what are the locations that we're, we're not reaching? What are the locations that we are reaching? Who is it that we're reaching there? What kinds of things are happening in those locations? And it, and it uh, helps us with our discussions around programming. Lisa? So hopefully that gave you sort of a brief view of some of the things that come out of the system. Robin and I tend to be really invested in sort of the nitty gritty of the system, right? The making stuff, making it get entered right, and me fixing all the mistakes that I've made in the past. Dan still hasn't found them all, but he's working on it. Um, almost, yeah. But I think what's important and, and what we're hoping that Lisa can share and Doug can share and, and maybe Dennis can share, is sort of what difference has having a system like this in place made for us as an organization, both internally in terms of program development and externally in, as far as engaging our stakeholders. And so I'd ask that uh, Lisa and then, then following Lisa, Doug's going to talk a little bit about that. And certainly if you have any questions as we're, as we're talking, I think we should have enough time that that we can incorporate that in and, and rather than just pushing everything to the end. Sounds great. Thank you, folks. Yes, from New Hampshire's standpoint, we, we've learned a lot doing the system. Um, certainly, as Steve mentioned earlier on, the collaboration with three other states in developing this made this a system that we truly never could have done. Even if Steve could do the technical part, the the just the vision of what we would like to see and what we could see was, was much enhanced by working with the, the partners here. Um, Dennis, Robin, Steve, and I are kind of the original, part of the original group that started this. So that's, that's certainly one lesson learned, that that collaboration, and it's continued on, quite honestly. We, we do enhancements. We have monthly uh, conference calls to talk about it. So, so that's a lesson learned. But what I really want to focus just a few minutes on is some of the information that we have has been invaluable to us with stakeholders. Cooperative extension in New Hampshire, as many states have experienced some pretty significant um, budget challenges over the last couple of years, gone through a reorganization process where we've asked our field staff to work in a much more regional basis than what they, they truly did before. We had kind of a very traditional county model uh, for many years. Um, so that was a big change for us programmatically, a really big change for our stakeholders. Needless to say, some of our stakeholders were a little concerned that in those 10 counties, somebody was going to be a winner and somebody was going to be a loser. There was no way possible that they could get the same level of service in a regional model than they could in a county model. So we had some convincing to do once we moved into this model that this was going to be successful. And the system, because it allows us to report by local, uh, by, by place, by county in our case, um, has really been an invaluable tool for us to create reports that we share back with stakeholders when they say, what have you done for us? Robin gave the example of commodity groups. Um, we also can do that by county. Here's how many people in the county have been touched by an extension program over the course of the last you know, months, weeks, year. Here are the people who have come into the county to do programming, who maybe aren't housed there, really kind of helped us illustrate that regional model. 
um, here are how many folks from your county have gone to extension programs perhaps in, an, in another county adjacent or a statewide program. So what we've been able to do is to give back to them information about how folks living in their county, residing there, are touched by extension, not only from the local staff, but in a very regional basis. It's been extremely powerful because even those very strong naysayers who, who really weren't sure because they weren't going to get their share, they were sure of that, we've been able to come back and say, no, you know, your folks are continuing to get really great service. So not only the numbers and the locale, but we can also pull that impact data by county and, and present that back to them. And here's the impact it's made in your particular county as well as statewide. So that's probably one of the biggest lessons I think that um, New Hampshire has learned in this as far as a great use of the system. The other thing we've done is share many of those reports back with our staff and that's a key piece because they're able then to see the work that they're putting into planning and reporting reflected in those reports and it's kind of an aha moment. Oh, it doesn't go into a black hole. You actually use the data we put into the system. And, and that's really a key piece because folks, as Robin and Steve said, may not like reporting, but you feel a whole lot better about it when you know that that information is being used for, for very positive um, and impactful kinds of reporting. So with that, I'm going to stop because I'm sure Doug has got some wonderful lessons that he can talk about as well. I took this on from a little bit different perspective, um, being the dean. Um, Robin and Karen Schneider, who's now passed, was part of our original crew that got together with New Hampshire and Maine and Massachusetts. Um, and they came back, I think Robin and Karen came back from the very first meeting and said, we're going to have this program up and running in a year. Now, if those have long memories, remember the USDA had spent $30 million and $40 million and $50 million over the previous five or six years trying to put together some kind of plan, uh, which never came to fruition. And damn, if in a year they didn't come back with a program, and Robin and Karen came back and said, we're going to be the first year guinea pigs, um, and we're going to put our plans in first. So the reason I was so supportive of that um, is that I want to know the great work that my people are doing across the state. Now sometimes I think, and I have a faculty member here who's been through the whole, the whole process, sometimes I thought my faculty and staff were scared to look backwards to see the impact that they were having, afraid that maybe they're not having the impact they think they're having. And planning and reporting is one of those things no one likes to do and likes to do worse if you think you're going to find something you don't want to see. And I think that led me to believe we needed a culture change, and that's the first one. I needed to be involved. I needed to be persistent and consistent. Persistent in that we were doing something. Persistent in that we were going to have a goal of behavioral change. We had been working. I'd worked in extension for 20-some years at that point. It was not going to be about improving people's knowledge. That's fine for the first two to three years of a program, but once you get to year three, four, five, six, and on, you should be able to start showing that people are making behavioral changes. Because from my perspective, that means you as an educator, you as a uh, faculty member, are not thinking about how you're teaching. Uh, because if you can't get someone to change, even one, I, my big thing is if you come with 100 and tell me 97 of them intend to change, I'm going to go, eh. If you tell me one of those 100 changed and give me the data to say they've changed, I'm happy. I'd rather take one that's changed than 97 that promised change because I know I promise myself each time I leave one of these workshops, I'm going to do that. And 97% of the time, I don't do that because I get back in, in the life. So it was persistent and consistent support, I think, from me. Um, Robin sends an email out. I, may, I don't follow up everyone, but every few I'll follow up and just kind of reiterate the message that she's sending. That, yeah, it is time to report. Yeah, it's getting close to the deadline. Yeah, we're not hearing enough from you. Yeah, this is very important if we want our funding. 
Um, so that kind of persistent and consistent um, over the last six, seven years, however many years it's been now, I think is important. Not that faculty and staff, you can ask Ellen, not that faculty and staff enjoy reporting. That's, that's not part of it. But I also used to get concerns from our clientele. They're spending all this time planning and reporting. So my retort back or my question back was um, 225 work days a year as a full-time employee. How many days do you think it's appropriate for them to stop, sit on their butts at their desk, and think about what they're going to do? Is three, four, five days too much? Well, no. If they still had, and if it takes four or five days to report that over the next, so it's 200 days or 210 days, you know, is that enough work time and the others being planning and reporting? Most everyone I talked to in the clientele said absolutely yes. I said, I just hope they sit down for a day to think about their planning. And they spend four days during the year reporting. And so I didn't hear much from the clientele that were tapped by faculty to come talk to me about programming, planning, and reporting from that point forward. So it's that knowledge, I think, at that highest level that's critically important. Uh, it's also, and it's not a bullet up here, but it's absolutely important, essential, you have a calm, helpful and knowledgeable leader at the program, which Robin is. She has utmost patience. Uh, anyone in our system, she's probably the well, best liked person in our system, and she works with everyone on planning and reporting. And so it, it's, it's just amazing she has the patience, because not all the questions are fun, easy, and sometimes they're very, very repetitive. Um, the other thing we always said was, Planning is for the individual. The reporting is for the individual. You give me good data, whatever you think you have as an individual faculty program staff, we'll turn it into the reports that the state needs and the feds need. Do this for yourselves. Do this to show the great work you're doing, to feel great about the work you're doing, to have fun with the work you're doing, to show the, the, the steps forward that your work is making uh, in your state. You give us those great stories, those impact stories, we'll provide the data. We'll put that, that stuff together the way the state and the feds want it. We don't need you worrying about that. Um, so we have to have confidence in that data. Um, and so that's what this program uh, now has given us. Um, Robin's been doing this a long time prior to, we call it, we euphemistically call it Albert, as in Albert Einstein, not as an acronym. Uh, back in Vermont, um, weeks uh, were taken in preparing our uh, federal report. Weeks. That stretched into months, I should probably say. And uh, Now it's days to weeks. OK, a week to pull all the data we need for our federal reports. Now, is the data all perfect? No, she sorts through it. She still has to sort through it. Not everyone is great at reporting and being consistent. But then that gets into the middle piece. It's not an artificial intelligence system. Anyone who uses it, anyone who implements it needs to know it's not an artificial intelligence system. All the intelligence resides within your minds as faculty and staff and as administrators. You're the ones that know what has to be done. You're the ones that still have to take the time to think about what you're planning and what you're trying to accomplish. You're the ones that still have to lay out the timeline. You're the ones that still have to decide on the indicators, whether that's behavioral change or knowledge or, or societal change, whatever that happens to be. Um, and then this is just a convenient way, and some people may argue about the convenience, but this is a convenient way of collecting that data so that at the end of the year, we can run reports in a matter of, of a week, put together what we need for our feds and for our state. And so for us, that is a critical aspect of the program. Um, I'm probably going on longer than I should, but I, I've got two other points. Behavior change was our goal. It was a goal I set out. I want our folks to be making a behavioral change in our clientele. That needs to be there. After 20 years in extension personally, some of that at Michigan State, going in and giving your spiel and walking out the door does not have a long-term impact. Change does. Interrupt you guys, yep. That's a question from our viewing audience. Oh, about okay. Behavior change. 
Okay, so um, with that, I'll get to that as well. But anyway, uh, my other, doo -doo -doo -doo, what was the other point? Oh, um, I use it as a bully pulpit, my position, uh, to keep this persistence and consistence going. So, but our cultural change is our folks have gotten tremendously better. Not perfect, but tremendously better in writing impact statements and giving us good data. Tremendously better. Now, I'm always impatient. I think we can get better. And, but, you know, in seven years, when I look backwards, I oh, it's, wow, how far we've come. When I look forward, I say, well, how much more we got to do? But they're, you know, they have to be complimented on how well they've done. So, Marissa asks, but are the numbers enough? Uh, stakeholders want to see behavioral change. Struggle in how that we measure that. It's not easy. But we don't have a really high bar. And I say that with all due respect to the, any evaluators in the group. If you're putting on a nutrient management workshop and you're helping them write nutrient management plans, and then you're out in the field over the next six months and you're talking to farmers about nutrient management plans and they walk to their pickup and they pull out the nutrient management plan you help them write, and they turn to page 12 and start talking about what that field was and what they were planning for it, I think that's a behavioral change. And you should be able to document that as a faculty member. If 12 of the 18 people you worked with the year before show up to revamp that program and talk about all the things that they've been doing over the past year as part of that plan, I have no problem with that story coming from the faculty member saying, I had 12 and they, or six or eight, or I just picked up six new farmers that are coming in based on what the other 12 were talking about their nutrient management plan. Um, Ellen's here and does a lot of community work. Part of the action is people getting involved in their local communities. So when she does a workshop teaching people how to become involved, she can monitor if some of her class become town meeting moderators, become the heads of committees, take on volunteer activities to pull a committee together to address some issue in a community. I accept that as perfectly good indication of behavioral change within that community. So from that perspective, I take a really, you got to learn to to crawl before you walk, before you run. And I think in extension, we try to run on evaluation. And I'm really happy with just crawling right now. And we'll increase that competency of our people and our, and our impacts and, and maybe have statistically significant results in 30 years. But right now, I just soon have good statements about how we're crawling forward and we're making a positive impact. Um, So you can use the wireless mic if you want. But that is, I'm done. I can also take this off, I think. That'll really mess everyone up. Um, also, to, to speak to Marissa's question, um, one of the things that we didn't really focus on or talk about is, is within our system is we try to capture a lot of narrative or qualitative information as well. And just to give you a specific example of how I've, I've seen this happen in New Hampshire, is um, our dean often gets asked, well, how are you working with the rest of the university? OK, you're over there. You're sort of a separate division. How are you engaging with our university faculty across all departments? And so historically, that meant that, oh, crap, someone asked John the question. And let's send out an email to everyone, all staff, right? All staff email. Please send me an email by close of business today in how you have worked with UNH faculty in the last year. And then some poor unfortunate soul, Lisa, would end up at, in the middle of the night reading through 300 emails and trying to assemble this together if she got the answers to the emails. What we've done instead is within the system that we use, Right? We're able to say, look, we want people to uh, report when they have had this kind of engagement with UNH faculty. But it's not isolated. Just, a, oh yeah, I worked with so-and-so. It's linked back to, I worked with so-and-so, and it would involve these participant, this 
this audience. It occurred in this location. It was related to this program or this grant or what have you. There are a lot of different facets. So it goes beyond the reason we do that is we try and be able to surface those stories because as Marissa said, numbers aren't enough. I mean, guess what? If we go and show people these tables, their eyes glaze over faster than mine do. Um, but what we try and do is be able to surface those stories at the appropriate moment for people to be able to see them. So when Lisa needs to go in because the commissioners in Carroll County said, geez, you know, we're not getting our money's worth this year. What's going on? That she can go into the system and she's looking at the Carroll County table of numbers, but she can also see all those stories because sometimes the stories communicate a lot more effectively than just the data do. Um, so I think having that combination within one overarching system of the the data, the numbers, right, that we need, uh, but also tying that into the stories is really important. We have time for questions. Um, I don't even know if you can see that, it's so small. There are some prompts up there. One of the things I'd love to hear is sort of how uh, folks in other states have sort of addressed some of these challenges. I think we all, you know, this is one of those things when Dave Gray talks about platforms. Um, we face the same challenges in extension all over the country and yet oftentimes we look inward for the solution. Uh, we were really lucky that we had the support of some, of some people to let us look on a more regional basis. Helps that we're small, right, that we needed each other. So that was a good driving force, but that we were able to learn from each other. And so I'd like to take the opportunity if anybody here has something to share or questions for, for anybody here. To, to go ahead and I'll give you the microphone so you can ask the question. I have a question on the technical part. Is it based like on a New Hampshire server and everybody logs into your system, especially now that Colorado and Michigan and whoever have joined, or, or did you sell them the program or, or technically how does it work? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Oh, such an easy question, such a hard answer. Uh, we've sort of played around with some different models. So Michigan actually has their own version of the system that they sort of run themselves. If you go to lmprs.net, one of the things that you'll be able to see is New Hampshire, Vermont, uh, Maine, Massachusetts, Colorado, and Delaware. And one of the other things that we didn't talk about is that these, these reports are transparent. So it, I'm not saying that a lot of people do this, right? But anybody can go in and take a look at sort of what we've published out as what we've done, what we plan to do and what we've done. So if you had an interested citizen in your state that wanted to see, they can go in and see for better or for worse. Gets back to Doug's uh, mantra about the importance of that quality information going in. Um, so for the, the other states, the ones I mentioned outside of Michigan, uh, the site is actually hosted on a commercial server um, and we have basically people log in, you know, the, each state manages their own settings and configuration and users. So Robin can make an adjustment for Vermont that says, you know what, uh, for these planning years, we don't really care about asking this question of our staff, um, but then turn it on later. And that doesn't affect New Hampshire or Maine or, or anything else. And they can also change some of the wording. So again, this whole extension thing, right? We're all different. So Vermont has projects and Maine has issue areas and we have programs and someone else calls it something else. And so this is one of the the challenges in building a system that's going to work for multiple states, but really the, the benefit that came from that was we really had to think and we, we really thought about this stuff and we had some long meetings <laughs> in hashing through how do we envision this working, um, but that built in a strength. It may have complicated the endeavor, but I think it built in a strength that we wouldn't have had, any one of us would have had if we had just done our own.
Um, so we're in the process of um, sort of, we have a new system for reporting. We're trying to use Salesforce. It's all ready to go, and now we're trying to get people to use it. And um, so it's really been difficult, and just the telling, telling people, oh, you have to do this now, um, it doesn't really work. So I mean, it, the bully pulpit is good and great, but um, I'm wondering, um, what is the most effective, or if there are a few um, ways that you've really communicated this value? I know showing, you know, this is what the data looks like, and hey, we're doing a great job, or, or not, here are things to work on, but um, how did you really get people to come around to reporting is a good thing, and, um, or it, it, if they even have, I mean. <laughs> reporting is a less than evil thing. That's our goal. Uh, <laughs> Somebody want to. I mean, I will say one thing uh, as I hand over the microphone to Dennis from Maine is uh, my mantra has always been to, to show the individual the benefit to them. Uh, I started out life as an ag agent, or maybe not life, but some life. Um, you know, I saw reporting as this circular bin into which I fed information. I didn't know what happened to it. I didn't know, I knew nothing. I just knew that you're required to report. I was a new guy, I'm like, okay, I'll report. But I had no idea what happened to it. And I think so one of the things that when Robin was talking about what's available to the individual is to show them, this is beneficial to you. You need your faculty contract, we're gonna give you your faculty contract, right? You just need to print it off and sign it. You're good to go. Part of it as well, it being in a contract situation, um, they, uh, faculty and, and our program staff, have to go through some kind of reappointment, annual evaluation. And so it's easy to click that this is for my scholarship, this is for my teaching, this is for my service. And so it collects it over time. You can, uh, re you wrote a report, you can attach it in the system. Um, so you wrote a paper, you can put the citation, you could put the whole paper in the system, attach it. So it's all there. So we were trying to sell it very much on, it had to be usable for the individual faculty and staff. That doesn't mean they all ran to use it. Um, but also, everything that went into it came through excruciatingly long meetings as well as about, we started out like 300 or 500 indicators, and now we're down way under 100. But, you know, that was a stepwise process. Everybody needed to see themselves. We had all kinds of goals, but everyone had to see themselves. And then when they start working in it, you know, they started buying into it, and yeah, you still have to do it, and me being interested in that they were doing it, that's the bully pulpit part. Um, but eventually, oh, you know, this is getting tiring. Well, Robin and I are not telling you you have to have 300 goals and 500 indicators. We prefer a lot less. So then you get down, you drop two or 300, and a couple of years go by, and, you know, we still don't need this many. Wonderful. We get rid of some words, so it says financial improvement in an area. It doesn't have to say in hogs, in dairy, in, Michi in you know, one thing or another. So it's, it's an iterative process, but it took that engagement of faculty and staff, I think, from the beginning. I would just add that um, it takes time, that there's, there's not a, uh, going to be a big shift. There, everybody's not all of a sudden going to come to the table. So I think allowing and understanding that the culture change is going to take time, and it is a culture change. And I think the other key thing is going back to what Doug had said about um, being held accountable, having leadership be involved. There has to be that commitment from leadership. And um, the transparency, I think, is the other issue that if the system um, is transparent and people understand that that information can be seen by others and it will be seen by others, you know, as well as being something that they can access themselves. I think that's really key, that level of accountability, that this is going to be used for your review. This is going to be used to share with stakeholders. Um, I, I often will do up a report. The uh, university president is doing a speech for the Chamber of Commerce in a particular county. So I pull the information from the system for him. And then what I do is I send it out to the faculty and staff in the organization and said, this was our latest inquiry. Here's what I shared with the president's office. Often, I will get a phone call. Well, how come my program wasn't in there? Well, let's go check and see what happened. 
So guess what? We go into the system and it's not there. So it's understanding that, you know, so it took a few of those reality checks for people to actually understand that if you don't report it, it can't be used and it will be used. And I live dangerously, so early on, uh, the president asked for some materials, so we printed off all the impact statements that had been written by individuals. Not everyone did, but we had a quite a long list with all the grammatical mistakes, all the spelling errors, and I sent it out and saying, this is what's going to the president's office. Do you feel comfortable with this? <laughs> now, I did do a spell check in, before we sent it, and a, and a, and a, but are, do you feel comfortable is this the stuff you put in? And if so, it, it got better. It just gets better. You know, this this system is really as much as anything just a container for for the work that people have to do outside the system, and it's it's fundamentally logic model based. And so we've done tons of work, as have these other states, on developing logic models for individuals and groups, and those logic models for you know, a professional for a, a career faculty member, this is their educational plan. This is how they decide what really the issues are and what their goals are and if they've met those goals. So, so it's really so much more than a, a reporting planning and report, reporting system. It's, it really reflects the important educational planning that people need to do. Um, also, there's a couple of little tricks in the system for almost anything you can imagine, one of which that you can turn on or turn off as a given user or state. Uh, is the, f the uh, uh, ability to review and approve people's plans and reports as supervisors. So you can s uh, assign each person a supervisor, and that supervisor gets to look at that report and say, good enough or not good enough, send it back and do better. And, um, and uh, particularly if people don't report enough, you report how many days you've done on a certain thing, and that adds up cumulative over a time and a year. And if you're at, you know, 35 days after a year, your, your supervisor is going to be talking to you. So, so there's, you know, many, many, many things. I want, I want to give time for some other questions if we have them. I just would also say the other thing I think it, it requires some organizational discipline to not ask for the same thing again. If you, if you let people report into the system and then come back to them six months later, seven months later, and say, oh, by the way, could you just send me an email on what you did? And they're like, well, why the hell did I? Oops. It's being broadcast on the internet. Oh, no. Um, you come, they're going to just say, why are you asking me to say, tell you what I already told you? Uh, Barb. This kind of ties into that. Uh, I would imagine you would like to have as much information as early as possible, you know, as f recent as the program occurred. But I'm wondering, in the real world, uh, do your faculty and staff report as programs occur, or is there a mad dash by some deadline, which could either be uh, when you need the data to DC or when their um, promotion and tenure review is up? And so I'm going to. Let, let some people speak to that, but uh, the, one, this was one of the foundational principles of the system was that we, we're not going to require a particular model of how you choose to report. So we have people who report every day, right? They get done their day and they go and they do a quick report on what they've done that day. And we have other people who, you know, would just soon do it once a year. Uh, and it's up to each organization here has some different standards. So I'll just let them quickly mention that. Um, in New Hampshire, we try to get people to report at least quarterly. Um, and there's nothing like a really good crisis sometimes to really make that happen. Uh, an example would be it's budget time in the county, and um, the commissioners would like to see a report about um, what has gone on and how many folks have participated and what are the impacts. And they need it by this week. And so we run that report. We put those numbers together and send it to our county office administrator who has asked for this information. Um, and they take one look at it and say, oh, this is not right. There's a whole piece missing here. Uh, they're really good at going to their colleagues then and saying, hey, you need to get your reporting into the system because I need this tomorrow. And it's going to impact our county funding. So crisis, although we don't like them, there are some benefits every now and then to doing that. And I would say in Vermont, we, we encourage quarterly, um, but some people do it more frequently. Some people do it once a year. 
um, although we push them. What, what we will see in ours is that people will report their numbers but may wait six months or a year to put in their impact statement because we're after behavior change and it takes most of my folks do survey six months to a year after they do their workshop to figure out who might have changed. Um, so it varies. The only thing I would add is that um, it, it depends. We ask them to report uh, quarterly on their outputs, so the number of things that they did, the time that they invested, and mm -hmm. then as they get their evaluative data and they can write their impact statements, is, um, they can put that in at any time, but that likely is not quarterly. Um, in Maine, we ask them to report three times a year, but it's personality driven. Like Stephen said, some people report multiple times per day. That's sort of fanatic, frankly, but uh, some people but do it. Right. That's right. <laughs> some people report um, uh, in the last 10 minutes of the reporting year, or maybe the week after, but we try. Yeah. And I'd just add that the system has in mind a year, right, as a, as a time frame. So that is sort of built into the system where people go from year to year. Um, we just about have to wrap up. I just want one more question. Hi, I'm Allison Van Eenen. I'm an extension specialist in um, California. And one of the questions I have that uh, seems to be a disconnect with our reporting system is if you have federal grants, there's the, I think it's now called something different. It used to be report. Thank you. So there's the report, there's the multi state project report kind of equivalent. And none of that talks to our. Um, campus-based uh, reporting system, and that doesn't talk to our extension-based reporting system. And so you said something about discipline not asking for the same information twice. We're actually giving the same information four times. And I just wondered if, if that, how do you work with the federal granting requirements, and how does that tie into your system? I can tell you that we try not to ask other people for the same information more than once, but we get asked for the same information more than once. Does anybody want to take a quick stab at the sort of federal reporting side since you've all just had fun doing that? My quick answer is that our system, we only use it for our internal base funded work. We do not ask for them or anyone to report what they did on grants or contracts within this system because we know they're already reporting it under another system. I'd say that um, Stephen Judd is as much of a wizard as you've ever been in the room with or seen. And he is, he is ready today, like he's been for years, to do what it needs to do behind the scenes to translate our data directly to federal systems. It's just that they haven't yet been able to do that already. Their projects have been fairly much in development. Uh, Stephen and our system is flexible enough to, to, to pull that information together in whatever way they need it and to translate it, I believe, out without much trouble. But, but you know, I guess I'm trying to say that it's, it's too soon or it's, it's in the future, we're hopeful. Um, yeah, it, it's a challenge. What we try and do, honestly, is we try to, the, our system will provide the information in a format such that a few unfortunate souls get to do a lot of copying and pasting into their federal reports. Um, and, but for the individual, you know, they hopefully, they don't see that, right? This is taken care of on the back end by the system. As long as they're doing, we built this system to meet our own needs with in mind to the extent that it can meet the other needs that we have is great but the system is not about completing the federal report the system is about enabling us to plan and report effectively to engage with our stakeholders and quite honestly engage with our own staff to make their programs better um, and, and hopefully we've done that to some extent i think we still have a lot more to do um, but I, I think we've at least made a dent in that and, and had some effect on the culture of our own organizations in the process. So I think we're out of time. You're going to see us around at the conference. You want to talk to us. You have other questions. I'd love to hear what you know, other folks are doing because uh, you know, I can certainly learn from that. The slides will be up, are, are up.